Greetings. Father Mark 79, continuing the course on Christian antiquity, the fathers of the church, the patristic period. Last time we began the reign of Pope Anicetus, Pope number 11, who reigned from 155 to 166. Uh, we covered St. Polycarp, a father of the church, uh, his excerpt of his writings, as well as uh, the account of his martyrdom in one, uh, 156. So now we continue. This is Pope Anicetus, Part B, uh, in which uh, uh, another father of the church who was active during the reign of Pope Anicetus was St. Justin Martyr, lived from around 98 to 165 A.D., he made priceless contributions to the uh, uh, Christian apologetics. We've introduced that already, so I won't repeat all that. As well as serving as an early witness to some key developments in church history. So, um, St. Uh, Justin makes it. Uh, he is enumerated as number 23. In Jerome's list, St. Jerome's list of illustrious men, about whom St. Jerome wrote the following. Justin, a philosopher, and wearing the garb of philosopher, a citizen of Neapolis, a city of Palestine, and the son of Priscus, son of Bacchaeus, labored strenuously on behalf of the religion of Christ insomuch that he delivered to Antoninus Pius and his sons and the Senate a work written against the pagans and did not shun the ignominy of the cross. He addressed another book also to the successors of this Antoninus. Marcus Antoninus, here again, it, 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 they call him, Jerome calls him Marcus Antoninus uh, Varus, but it, it, it's Marcus Aurelius. Um, another volume of his, Against the Nations, is also extant, where he discusses the nature of demons, and a fourth, Against the Nations, which he entitled Refutation of Yet Another, on the Sovereignty of God, and another book, which he entitled Psalter, it's the Psalms, and another on the soul. The dialogue against the Jews, which he held against Trypho, a leader of the Jews, and also notable volumes against Marcion, remember him, the heretic, which Irenaeus also mentions in the fourth book, Against Heresies. Also, another book, Against All Heresies, which he mentions in the Apology, which is addressed to Antoninus Pius. He, when he had held Diatribos, that's a debate, in the city of Rome, and had convicted Crescens, the cynic, who said many blasphemous things against the Christians, of gluttony and fear of death, and had proved him devoted to luxury and lust, at last accused of being a Christian through the efforts and wiles of Crescens, he shed his blood for Christ. End quote. All right, uh, Justin was born in the city of Flavia Neapolis. Uh, Flavia, F-L-A-V-I-A, Neapolis, N-E-A, P-O. L I S. Born in 98 AD, only 30 years after that city, Flavia, was founded by the future emperor Vespasian in the year 68 AD during Vespasian's campaign to suppress the Jewish revolt or the Jewish War of Independence, which we previously covered. The city was near the, the, the site of ancient. Shechem, the Old Testament Shechem, which was a religious center for the Samaritans, situated in the valley between Mount Ebal, E-B-A-L, and Mount Gerizim, G-E-R-I-Z-I-M. By the time of Justin's birth, the inhabitants had largely lost their connection to their roots as Samaritans. The city was a, a, a pagan Roman colony at the time of Justin's birth. Justin showed no indication that he was even aware of the Samaritan heritage of the area 
And Justin was a very well educated, very well read man. So if he didn't know, it's unlikely anyone else in the area did. His grandfather was a pagan Greek, the name of Bacchaeus, and his father was a pagan Roman named Priscus, possibly a retired soldier. Justin was therefore reared as an uncircumcised pagan. The characteristic that set Justin apart from all others in his sleepy little colonial town was his intellect. Justin wanted to understand everything, and he could find no peace until he knew the answers. A provincial outpost like Neapolis lacked the libraries to feed such curiosity. Excuse me. All right. So that was that was almost that almost could have been bad. So seminarians, be nice to your staff, because you know I, that's they just saved me from something. Got my mind is scattered. Something that I I had completely forgotten, completely forgotten. God, that's a it's a mistake. That's the kind of mistake I hadn't made in years. But you know, man, it's, where was I? Oh yeah, okay. So uh, he wanted to understand everything, uh, and his little his little town just didn't have the libraries for it. So as a young man, he he left. He started traveling and visit the great cities with the great libraries, seeking knowledge. So Justin, just by his nature, was a, was a seeker. He just he, he loved loved to learn. He first learned Stoicism. It was a moral and philosophical system we've encountered already. Very popular among traditional minded Romans therefore taught in his hometown, which was populated by legionary veterans and their descendants. Established centuries before, as we covered earlier in the course, by Zeno of Sichem from the island of Cyprus, and brought to Athens by Zeno around the year 313 BC, 22 years after the death of Aristotle. Stoicism was named for the Stoa Poikali, which is the painted colonnade on which Zeno gave his lectures. Zeno lived over a century too early to be part of the back to the original Platonic revival uh, of Antiochus of Ascalon, whom we already covered. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Zeno was repelled by all variations on the theme of philosophical despair, which existed in the post-independence period of Greece after their self-destructive impulse in the Peloponnesian War caused them to, or resulted in the Greeks losing what they valued the most, their independence. So conquered first by Philip of Macedonia, the father of Alexander the Great, uh, then, then ultimately conquered by the Romans. Uh, Zeno rejected the extremes. Always be careful of extremism. He rejected the extremes of either hedonism or skepticism. Um, and took as his inspiration uh, Socrates uh, to, to establish principles of certainty by, by, by means of reason and then construct a mode of existence based on those foundational certainties. It is therefore no surprise that we find familiar elements in Justin's writing from Stoicism. And because of Justin's use of them, since Justin's the father of the church, he used Stoic ideas in his writings that therefore legitimized uh, at least those aspects of Stoicism for Christians, so they would later develop a, a Christian Stoicism. Now, of course, it's, it, it's not 100% identical with the pre-Christian version. As, you know, for example, so Stoics were, were okay with suicide. They thought in, under some circumstances that suicide was not only 
acceptable and defensible, but what might actually be obligatory. That obviously is not a Christian sentiment. And also Stoics, because of their uh, very strong adherence to uh, belief in the natural law, regarded uh, the, the, the killing of any newborn with, with any kind of birth defect as, as being not only legitimate and defensible, but actually a, a positive good for the species. As mean, you know, reasoning that if, if deformed means that it, it does not have a full human nature. You know, so it it should be removed. So not one hundred percent identical, but that it did have Stoicism did have many ideas uh, that that were consistent with Christianity because of the natural law. So Stoicism was built on three intertwined sets of assertions from logic, physics, and ethics. From the Zoroastrians. Zeno appropriated belief that the material universe was created from fire. So that's Stoic physics. From Babylonian astrology, Zeno internalized fatalism as a cosmology, as a principle. Fatalism is belief in fate. Now, Stoics, as a rule, did not go to the extremes of Gnosticism which regarded fate as, as an arbitrary imposition of material confinement on the soul by evil archons. Instead, the Stoics had a more generalized concept of fate as meaning that the individual cannot alter the unfolding of the physical universe. We can only choose to act or not to act and in which manner we will do so, in which manner we will act or in which manner we will flee from action. From Aristotle, Zeno borrowed belief that we learn empirically. Empirikos is the Greek word for experience. So empirical method is we learn by doing, we learn by observation. Early Stoicism was therefore very interested in the natural world and understanding the laws by which nature operated. After Zeno's death, his students divided his teachings, ironically, this is the last thing he would have wanted, and developed them into separate philosophies of logic, physics, and ethics. It's completely contrary to his holistic approach. So that developed for a while. And then there was a back to the original, a back to heritage Stoic movement, you know, getting back to the authentic Zeno, which was led by Chrysippus of Soli. He moved to Athens around the year 260 B.C. to study at the academy, which, which was Plato's academy, but Plato was dead, so it had already been warped by the skeptics. And he left in disgust to join the Stoa, becoming leader of the Athenian Stoics in 232 B.C. He articulated uh, return to the unified view of reality that was so essential to Zeno. So Chrysippus... Uh, his revival became Stoic Orthodoxy, which was mediated from the Greek-speaking world into the Latin-speaking world uh, after the conquest of Greece was complete. Two of Rome, two Roman philosophers were most responsible for this mediation into the Latin language. Uh, Marcus Tullius Cicero, who was murdered by Mark Antony for repeated public orations warning that Antony and his ilk were going to be responsible for the end of the Roman Republic, which, of course, they were, and Lucius Annius Seneca, who was forced to commit suicide by the emperor Nero. By the reign of Pope Anicetus, the life of Justin Martyr, Stoicism gained the highest possible endorsement when the future emperor, the designated heir of the Emperor Antoninus Pius and then the next emperor in his own right, Marcus Aurelius, was not only a Stoic himself, uh, not only lived according to Stoic principles, uh, famously so, but also wrote uh, pro promoting Stoic principles. His famous book, The Meditations, is still still appears. It's, it's used not only in, in philosophy, but also uh, excerpts sometimes appear in literature courses as well as psychology. The Stoic belief that creation is built according to a logical order, 
appeal to Justin's intellect and his desire for certainty. According to the Stoics, if one came to understand the rules of creation, then one had attained understanding of creation itself. The Stoics also taught a very strict moral code, which appealed to Justin, as much as it appealed to conservative Romans. Which remember that this is which is a militarized society, so that you know that uh, just just kind of taken for granted. Discipline was, was kind of it's just that was just life, it's the way life was. Uh, this code flowed from their ontological principle. Ontos means being, so their philosophy of being that creation operated according to logical rules, which. Uh, which are beyond our control, so that, that can be frustrating. But it's good because once we know them and once we, we, we accept that they're beyond our control, that's very much simplified, the task of living. So we do not need to invest energy in trying to change those rules. Instead, we just invest our energy in living within those rules in the most ethical way possible. Which meaning in accord with the natural law. So happiness for the Stoic, and and for the for the pre-Christian Stoic as well as for the Christian Stoic, as mediated through Justin, happiness is achieved by living in accord with the natural law. As because for Justin, if, if there there is a natural law, then obviously that had to come from God. So you're living in accord with the law of God. <clears throat> for the Stoic. The superior person is unmoved, morally unmoved, meaning one would perform, can and will and does, perform right action, whether in a condition of prosperity or adversity, in joy or in sorrow. That those conditions are irrelevant. Well, as you say, they're morally irrelevant. I mean, you have to deal with them, you know, you deal with good and bad, but, but morally they're irrelevant. So an, an, a, a morally correct act remains morally correct, you know, whether the person is in a state of happiness or sadness for whatever reason. So uh, this brings us to the, in Greek Stoicism, the highest virtue was apathia, meaning without passion. In Latin Stoicism, it was the virtue of equanimity the even spirit. The Stoic who had achieved this level of awareness would be immune to despair. It would still be subject to misfortune, as everyone is in, in the world, because that's, you know, that's, that's what existence means. Uh, but not despair. So misfortune is inescapable, but despair is not inevitable, if, you know, at least for the Stoic, in their, in their view, if existence is properly understood. So uh, Zeno was 10 years old when Alexander the Great died in 323. So he grew up in the period after Greece lost its independence and the Hellenistic syncretism fostered by Alexander and his successors was, was sweeping both east and west. Zeno's life overlapped with those of other post-independence philosophers who we encountered earlier who surrendered to despair. And their ideas also endured, were still around during the lifetime of Pope Anicetus and Justin Martyr, and were part of the of the discourse with which Justin had to deal and early church fathers had to deal. And some of these ideas are still with us. And so we, you, seminarians, future priests, you have to deal with. One of which, apropos... Apropos, uh, Epicurus of Samos. He was a declarative atheist who believed that the only purpose to existence was maximizing personal pleasure and minimizing personal pain. This approach created the condition of aterizia, uh, which is uh, freedom from agitation. One, one can understand the appeal. Uh, freedom from... <laughs> Oh God. Yeah, I did not plan that. I did not plan this. No, no, 
this freedom from agitation. Oh, well, of course. Yeah, that's uh, all right. <laughs> all right, so another delay with that. That's an another construction. We have a construction project that's been delayed again and again and again. And now, again, because the guy's not feeling well. Yeah, well, yeah, dude, neither am I. <sighs> okay, uh, Pyron, Pyron of Ellis is the father of philosophical skepticism. His solution was the principle of non-assertion. If one never asserts truth or falsehood, then one can exist with tranquility of mind. So this is the whatever, the whatever school of thought. What do you think of that? Oh, whatever. Archisilus of Pitane was a pupil of Pylon who went even further. He became scholarch of the Athenian Academy in 268 BC. Um, and he's considered the father of the middle academy, uh, of the academics, the, the skeptics, who argued that uh, one cannot even assert the principle of non-assertion. So one, one cannot assert that the principle of non-assertion is certain. Yeah. So what is that, whatever squared? Justin's restless curiosity, therefore, was not content with all of this. So he, he absorbed Stoicism, all that it had to offer. But he, he so okay, the logical order that appealed to him, the natural law, okay, that that's good. It learned. But he wanted to understand why there was a logical order, why the natural law existed. Not not just to, like like for a true Stoic, that doesn't matter. You don't need to understand it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got the message. Yeah, okay. Okay, I got the message. Another delay. One adjust. Um, why the natural law existed. Uh, so then he, he moved on. He became interested in Aristotle's writings, uh, who was a pupil of Plato, we already met, uh, tutor of, uh, you know, it. it why bother? It, it just, all right, excuse me. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Turns out that 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 box. That, well, anyway, okay. It's it's another thing. All right, back to <clears throat> Aristotle's writings were, were never never properly preserved. <clears throat> so what Justin's martyr studied of Aristotle uh, was what had been edited and compiled by Andronicus of Rhodes. Uh, around 30 BC, and by that time, Aristotle's followers were called the Peripatetics, after the colonnade surrounding the the Lyceum, where the uh, students and teachers would walk and uh, and while discussing philosophy, because they 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 had time to do that. You know, that's, 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 let's walk around the garden, spend all day talking about Antas. You know, that's that's yeah, that's another time. Um, Aristotle appealed to Justin because they both shared an insatiable curiosity about the world. Aristotle's writings range from biology to physics to religion to poetry, ethics, politics, philosophy. Aristotle taught that we learn through doing, we learn through experience. That's the empirical method. Uh, it was Aristotle's empirical ideology, ideology as cause and effect, uh, that offered Justin the promise of coming to the final truth of creation. All he had to do was trace back the cause and effect in reverse. Effect to cause, effect to cause. Just, just trace it back in reverse until you get to the first cause, the uncaused cause. So after mastering Aristotle, uh, Justin felt that still there's this, this, this something, something missing. He did not want to just know that there was a first cause. He wanted to understand why the process of causation existed. Why is there cause and effect? Why is there change? Well, why is it there just an eternal permanence of existence? Causation, cause and effect, uh, could and did uh, reduce uh, existence to a mechanism, 
a comprehensible mechanism operating according to observable patterns. But to Justin, this was like explaining how a ship worked without explaining why the ship existed. Therefore, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. No, he wants to know, wants to know. So Justin then moved further to the, to the fringes of, of the philosophical world by delving into the teachings of Pythagoras of Samos. We met him to move to Croton in southern Italy around 530 BC to establish an, an association uh, that was a, a hybrid of a, a science academy, a math school, and a cult. Pythagoras was first and foremost a mathematician. He deduced and demonstrated by mathematical formula the basic intervals of Greek music. It showed that even sound, even something that, that we can, cannot be touched, can still be measured, meaning there is still an order to it. And he generated the triangle theorem, you know, which, which we, you know, we talked about, the geometry, uh, measuring space, that there was order to space, the relationships of, with spatial relationships. So the Pythagorean philosophy which Justin studied, was again filtered this he's centuries after these guys lived. So it was filtered through yet another revival, Pythagorean, a revival of Pythagoras, uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, led by a guy named Eudorus, E-U-D-O-R-U-S, around the year 45 B.C. In this, Justin found a system through which answers could be calculated in repeatable equations. Okay, well, then if math could reveal the order, the underlying order, therefore unmask the secrets of sound and spatial relationships, Justin thought, well, then with patience and application, it might also reveal the secrets of everything else. Justin loved the clarity and the precision of mathematics, of measurement. But eh, not, not quite everything, not everything. That, some doubts developed for two reasons about Pythagorean philosophy. First, uh, Pythagoras believed in the pre-existence of the soul. So he was, in, he was, you know, was infected by that Gnostic idea, you know, that, that the souls just existed and that, that they're captured and imprisoned in these material bodies. And uh, second problem is Pythagoras believed in reincarnation. Neither proposition made any sense to Justin. If the soul pre-existed, then logically each soul would, would be a, a deity. Each soul would be divine, which is a manifest absurdity that would say that each of us is a, you know, is a deity, is a god. And that's just, that is ridiculous. Reincarnation, if reincarnation would be the telos, the, the end, the goal of, of life, then creation was a closed system, which would never change. And that's, that's something that simple observation disproves, that all life is in a state of growth and therefore change until it ceases to be life. So, okay, you know, there's another one, another school, learn something from it, but not, not quite enough. So his search next brought him to Plato. At the time Justin lived, uh, a version of Platonism was the most popular of the classical philosophies because so much of Plato's corpus of writing had survived in the form of dialogues, which were you know, easily accessible. Uh, you know, we talked about that. It's one of the reasons he wrote them that way. They're like little plays, you know, so they'd be easier to follow. <clears throat> um, uh, born into an aristocratic Athenian family, Plato's father, Pyrolampes was a friend and ally of Pericles, though Plato himself was never involved in politics. The pivotal experience of Plato's intellectual formation was becoming a student of Socrates. Justin was fascinated, just completely enamored, with the Platonic dialogues and their vivid presentation of intellectual discourse among individuals seeking to understand the essential nature of things. Of the wide spectrum of Plato's thought, 
Justin was most drawn to his theory of reality, that creation resulted from the action of a single, intelligent, ethical entity, the prime mover, the first mover, whose power actualized material things based on ideal ideas, ideal unchanging forms. Justin was convinced that Plato had grasped an essential truth in applying his concept of the forms to immaterial realities, such as goodness, truth, beauty, justice, loyalty, friendship. If those concepts existed in a perfect form in the mind of the prime mover, then it was possible to come to know objective truth. As those things don't change, they're not subject to the process of change as the physical universe is, which means they could come to be known. So, study that, read all the dialogues. But still, something eluded him. Plato offered no real way to come to know and interact with the prime mover. For Justin, that, 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 no, 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 that's not good enough. But he didn't know where else to go. He had investigated all the great philosophical schools of the day. He had learned a great deal, but still, it, it, he did not have the comprehensive understanding that he wanted. You know, to understand the nature of things, the way everything fit together, the whole system, it just, something was missing. It's noteworthy that there are many other options for, in his time that Justin did not even consider. It, it, apparently, it never occurred to him to, to explore any of the cults or the, the pagan mystery religions or any of the Gnostic movements. So even though he was reared a pagan, is, uh, get, uh, such limited emotive gatherings uh, evidently could not hold his attention or interest. A, the, this is a guy who lived in his head. This is definitely an intellectual. So by this point, we've arrived at the year 132 AD. Justin was 34 years old, living in Ephesus, that great cultural, religious, and commercial emporium of ancient Ionia, where a Christian community had existed for eight decades. St. Paul used Ephesus as a base of operations for three years. St. Timothy was martyred in Ephesus for opposing the debased cult of Cabelli. St. John the Evangelist lived in that city for many years. One day, Justin was walking near the port when he struck up a conversation with an old man. With Justin's fixation on finding the truth, the discussion soon focused on that topic. The old man took a tremendous risk and spoke of Christianity. Justin had heard of Christians. Oh, yeah, yeah, those are the ones they, they, they were renegade Jews. They worshipped some dead carpenter crucified for treason under the reign of Tiberius. They practiced cannibalism, I heard, and other sordid perversions in their secret meetings. The old man laughed. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. It's all based on misunderstanding. Now, it probably never occurred to Justin that the man was a criminal, according to the laws of the day. And in any case, Justin was not the type to go, you know, run and turn someone off, <laughs> turn someone in. Certainly not to a Roman legal system that considered justice to be the carnage of the arena. The old man offered to Justin a way to do what Plato had not, a means of coming to know the prime mover. There were men in history the old Christian said, gifted but still ordinary men who were able to have direct communication with the one true God. Christians call them prophets. Uh, the Greek word prof uh, prophetes means to uh, one who speaks for another. And many of these prophets left writings behind them which described their relationship and their conversations with God and the insights that, that God instructed them to reveal. Well, Justin was hooked. Okay, okay, well, I have to read this. And then once he read the prophets, naturally he was going to read everything else. And it took his breath away. The, 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 the scripture was a catalog of encounters between God and human beings. 
between the prime mover, you know, to use philosophical terms, the prime mover of creation, the first cause of creation, with the creation that it caused to be. In Christianity, Justin not only found the strong moral code that he liked, but he also he also found the reason for creation. And in the life and words of Jesus, Justin was able to look into the mind of God. He would spend the rest of his life as a committed Christian. For the next six years, Justin lived as part of the clandestine Christian community in Ephesus, earned his living as a teacher, a profession for which his lifelong quest for knowledge had ideally prepared him. It was during this period of his life that he wrote the 142-chapter long dialogue, see, Plato, influence of Plato, Dialogue with Trypho. That's T-R-Y-P-H-O. Written around the year 136 A.D. While living in Ephesus, Justin had a discussion or a series of discussions with this guy named Trypho, who was a Jewish scholar. He had studied a version of Platonism under uh, Corinthus, the Socratic, in Argos, that's in the Peloponnese. Uh, Trypho identified himself as a Hebrew of the circumcision, having escaped from the war lately carried out there. Uh, meaning, so remember that, so he's writing in the 130s, so that's the revolt, or from the Jewish perspective, the, the war of liberation led by Simon Bar Kokhba during the reign of the Emperor Hadrian. So Trypho escaped the Holy Land and Hadrian's reprisals. Uh, he had hung out in Corinth for a time and, 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 and obviously went to Ephesus because that's where he met Justin. Justin recorded their interaction in the dialogue with Trypho. It took place in the Kaistos, uh, which is uh, an open area, uh, in, um, uh, like a, a covered portico of uh, a gymnasium. <clears throat> this is a public, a public area that's is in, in, in Ephesus. Uh, Justin, <clears throat> the conversation started because Justin was wearing the recognizable philosopher's garb. Remember the, the quotes earlier from Jerome and Irenaeus said that Justin you know, wore the philosopher's garb. Uh, that was uh, the Greek outer cloak, uh, the, the hymation, which was um, externally, you, you, you've seen it, even though it, uh, in uh, statues and mosaics, paintings of the, of the, you know, the, the time, <clears throat> it looks like a simplified toga. Uh, but it's not a toga. Well, it is a simple. I mean, it's an outer garment like the toga. Well, I should say that the, uh, uh, the 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 toga was the outer garment, like the the tunic, you know, that that would go over the body. That 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 was different. That was the the Greeks would call that the chiton. Over that, uh, the Romans would put the toga. It would be draped around one shoulder and then over the arm. It's very elaborate uh, thing. So the Greeks, the the hymation was a smaller. Uh, simpler version of that to wear the outer cloak and it would go under one arm <clears throat> and it was you know characteristic of philosophers would wear that because there were many uh, statues and mosaics uh, in, in which Socrates wore that so that's why the style caught on uh, so that started the conversation uh, Trypho uh, said oh you know yeah I, I, I see you wearing as a philosopher I studied under this philosopher and so they started talking all right, so uh, the, all that introduction is in chapter one. So chapter two, uh, Justin described his studies in philosophy. So everything I just summarized about his life, that's, that's where I got it from. Chapter two and then chapter three, he records uh, the, the essential part, uh, his, converse, his uh, 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 first his meeting with the, the old man, the old, the, Christian, the old Christian in Ephesus, whom he does not name. So Justin said, uh, quote, And while I was thus disposed, when I wished at one period to be filled with great quietness and to shun the path of men, I used to go to a certain field not far from the sea. And when I was near that spot one day, which having reached, I purposed to be by myself, a certain old man, by no means contemptible in appearance, exhibiting meek and venerable manners, followed me at a little distance. And when I turned round to him, having halted, I fixed my eyes rather keenly on him. 
what greater work? And then they dialogue, they go back and forth. And <clears throat> that's one, one problem with the dialogue is they, they do tend to be very lengthy because it's you know written as a conversation. So skipping down to the next salient point Justin makes, quote, what greater work could one accomplish than this to show the reason which governs all and having laid hold of it and being mounted upon it to look down on the errors of others and their pursuits. But without philosophy and right reason, prudence would not be present to any man. Philosophy, then, is the knowledge of that which really exists and a clear perception of the truth. And happiness is the reward of such knowledge and wisdom. Then the old man says, well, but what do you call God? Justin, that which always maintains the same nature. See the unchanged? And in the same manner, and is the cause of all other things. See the first cause. That indeed is God. Um, The deity cannot be seen merely by the eyes, as other living beings can, but is discernible to the mind alone. As Plato said, and I believe. So then that dialogue goes on like that. Um, uh, chapter 4 is uh, on the soul itself, cannot see God. It has to be revealed. God has to be revealed. Chapter 5, the soul is not immortal. Uh, chapter 6, uh, about Plato and other. so I've already talked about that. So chapter 7, the old man, quote, There existed, long before this time, certain men more ancient than all those who are esteemed philosophers, both righteous and beloved by God, who spoke through the divine spirit and foretold events which would take place and which are now taking place. They are called prophets. These alone both saw and announced the truth to men, neither reverencing nor fearing any man, not influenced by a desire for glory, but speaking those things alone, which they saw and which they heard, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Their writings are still extant, and he who has read them is very much helped in his knowledge of the beginning and end of things, and of those matters which the philosopher ought to know, provided he has believed them. For they did not use demonstration in their treatises, seeing that they were witnesses to the truth above all demonstration and worthy of belief. And those events which have happened and those which are happening compel you to assent to the utterances made by them. Although indeed they were entitled to credit on account of the miracles which they performed, since they both glorified the Creator, the God and Father of all things, and proclaimed His Son, the Christ, sent by Him, which indeed the false prophets, who are filled with the lying, unclean spirit, neither have done nor do, but venture to work certain deeds for the purpose of astonishing men, and glorify the spirits and demons of error. But pray that above all things the gates of light may be opened to you, for these things cannot be perceived or understood by all, but only by the man to whom God and his Christ have imparted wisdom. So, Revelation. All right, chapter 8, Justin's uh, account, uh, his account of his reply to the old man. When he had spoken these and many other things, which there is no time for mentioning at present, he went away, bidding me attend to them, and I have not seen him since. But straight away a flame was kindled in my soul, and a love of the prophets, and of those men who are friends of Christ, possessed me. And while revolving his words in my mind, I found this philosophy alone to be safe and profitable. Thus, and for this reason, I am a philosopher. Moreover, I would wish that all, making a resolution similar to my own, do not keep themselves away from the words of the Savior, for they possess a terrible power in themselves, and are sufficient to inspire those who turn aside from the path of rectitude with awe, while the sweetest rest is afforded those who make a diligent practice of them. If, then, 
you have any concern for yourself, and if you are eagerly looking for salvation, and if you believe in God, you may, since you are not indifferent to the matter, become acquainted with the Christ of God, and after being initiated, live a happy life. Trifo's response. I approve of your remarks, and I admire the eagerness with which you study divine things. But it were better for you still to abide in the philosophy of Plato or of some other man, cultivating endurance, self-control, and moderation. That's the Stoics, of course. Rather than be deceived by false words and follow the opinions of men of no reputation. For if you remain in that mode of philosophy and live blamelessly, a hope of a better destiny were left to you. But when you have forsaken God and reposed confidence in men, what safety still awaits you? If then you are willing to listen to me, for I have already considered you a friend, first be circumcised, then observe what ordinances have been enacted with respect to the Sabbath and the feast and the new moons of God. And in a word, do all things which have been written in the law, and then perhaps you shall obtain mercy from God. But Christ, if he has indeed been born and exists anywhere, is unknown and does not even now know himself and has no power until Elijah come to anoint him and make him manifest to all. And you, having accepted a groundless report, invent a Christ for yourselves and for his sake are inconsiderately perishing, meaning the martyrdom. Okay, uh, so this brings us uh, through the first nine chapters, at least excerpts of the first nine chapters. Uh, It included uh, Justin's autobiography, which I've already summarized and won't repeat. Uh, He also gives a Christian view of the Hebrew Scriptures. He forthrightly acknowledged that the Hebrew Scriptures are the inspired Word of God. I mean, you know, the prophets are what initially converted him. The Mosaic Law was God's will for the people from the time of the Exodus up to the time of Christ. So he did not repudiate it, just said it, it had fulfilled his task. So a Jew living in that time sinned against God by not obeying the law. But the Hebrew Scriptures remained unfinished. They ended with a note of longing, of waiting, of watching for the fulfillment of the promise they contained. Is it so difficult to believe, Justin asked, that they would be fulfilled 13 centuries after Moses came down from Mount Sinai, which Justin referred to as Mount Horeb. I skipped, some of, I skipped a lot of it because it's so long, but he refers to Mount Sinai as Horeb. The Mosaic Covenant, Justin argued, was meant for the chosen people when they were the only ones who had a special revelation from God. To survive alone in such a world, an extreme regimen was necessary. The Jews had to act and feel differently from everyone else because they believed differently from everyone else. To that end, the the discipline, the very strict in some cases draconian discipline of the law, was a help and an aid. The propensity of the people to relapse into idolatry, recorded in in very depressing detail and by the prophets as we've covered previously, demonstrates how desperately such separation was needed. This paganism is tempting. It appeals to the emotions. It appeals to the senses. And, you know, as St. Paul said, the flesh wars against the spirit. It also proved that the Mosaic Law was not the conclusion of God's revelation. It was part of God's revelation, but was not the conclusion. It was not able to transform the human heart, as the prophet Jeremiah recognized. In keeping the Jews alive as a coherent community of faith, in, in the one true God, the Mosaic law had accomplished its purpose. Now, 
meaning in Justin's time, you know, and it, it was superseded by the new covenant because the new covenant is meant for the entire world. The separation of an isolated community was no longer necessary because the gospel had spread to, to you know, the known world for them was the Roman Empire, and the gospel had spread within the Roman Empire. This dissemination was slowed by the persecution of the church, but the message was getting out. It was out, and it was spreading. This replacement of the old law by the new, the old covenant by the new covenant, in no way implied any disrespect for the old covenant. The replacement was rather a fulfillment. The Mosaic law kept the people intact. The gospel law of love calls us beyond obedience into enlightenment. Of course, Justin admitted, accepting the replacement of the Mosaic law with the gospel law presupposes that the gospel law is indeed from God. And that was what Trifo was saying, you know, okay, this old man told you this, and you read the prophets, those prophets of mine, by the way, that they're from the Jewish heritage, and you completely misunderstood them. So was Christianity something just made up by, by a guy, and was the old law still unfulfilled? Well, for Trifo, that yes, it was unfulfilled. The, the, he was still waiting for the Messiah. But Justin, you know, refu- he, he, he rejected that assertion. And to prove it, Justin embarked on a tour through the Old Testament, uh, which is worth reading, chapters 89 through 108. Far too long for me to quote here, but if you, if seminarians, if you're interested, you can read it. He especially uh, goes through the prophets, showing how closely he had read uh, all of those, and showing how Jesus was the anointed, foretold, whom the chosen for whom the chosen people longed. Now, much of Justin's argument is, if you do read through it, It'll sound very familiar because it's so much a part of our tradition. He dwelled on the suffering servant prophecies of Isaiah to dissuade Trifo from dismissing Jesus' messianic claims because of his human weakness. How could this guy be the anointed of God if he ended up dying on a Roman cross? Uh, Justin also uses the Emmanuel prophecies of Isaiah, uh, that the Messiah would come from a virgin birth, a miraculous birth, a miraculous intervention in human history. Justin quoted the prophet Micah, who foretold that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Referred to Zephaniah, who saw that the final drama in the Messiah's life would begin with him entering Jerusalem on a donkey in a posture of humility. And he drew the parallels between the fourth servant prophecy of Isaiah and the actual passion of Jesus, which we read about during Holy Week. The writings of Justin are used throughout the Catechism. And we're going to refer to some, but we don't have time. That's how many it's referred to in the Catechism, which is a striking tribute, considering this guy was born in the first century you know, and lived into the second. Uh, it's a tribute to the versatility of his thought and the importance of his contribution to the development of Christian theology, but also in the line of continuity. So, for example, the Catechism number 498 uh, makes use of the Dialogue with Trifo, chapter 99, uh, on the virginal conception, uh, arguing against the, so, you know, some would say that um, some, you know, in antiquity said that, um, some would say that, you know, Christians just, that this idea of the virginal birth of Jesus, Christians just made that up to give more credence to their claim that Jesus was the Son of God. So far from it, as Justin points out, that Christians Christians are mocked for that claim. And if anything, that's that's a stumbling block for some. So if Christians were just going to make up a religion, it would not include something like that. You know, something that would be so hard to accept and so hard to understand. They would just make up something, you know, closer to the to the Greek myths. Uh, you know that that Hercules was the son of uh, Zeus and and some uh, what was her name Alcmene, a uh, human female, and uh, so he was a demigod. I mean that that's something that would be more comprehensible. You know if they would if they were going to make something up. <clears throat> Further uh, in the dialogue with Trifo, chapter one hundred, 
uh, Justin elaborated as follows, quote, uh, Then what follows? But you, the praise of Israel, inhabit the holy place. Declare that he who is to do something worthy of praise and wonderment, being about to rise again from the dead on the third day after the crucifixion, and this he has obtained from the Father. For I have showed already that Christ is called both Jacob and Israel. And I have proved that it is not in the blessing of Joseph and Judah alone that what relates to him was proclaimed mysteriously, but also in the gospel it is written, He said, All things are delivered unto me by my Father. And no man knows the Father but the Son, nor the Son but the Father, and they to whom the Son will reveal him. That's a reference to Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. Accordingly, continuing the quote, Accordingly, he revealed to us all that we have perceived by his grace out of the scriptures, so that we know him to be the first begotten of God and to be before all creatures, likewise to be the son of the patriarchs, since he assumed flesh by the virgin of their family, and submitted to become a man, dishonored, and subject to suffering. Hence also among his words he said, When he was discoursing about his future sufferings, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the Pharisees and scribes, and be crucified, and on the third day be raised. That's a reference to Matthew 16. He said then, that he was the Son of Man, either because of his birth by the Virgin, who was, as I said, of the family of David and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, or because Adam was the father both of himself and of those who had been first enumerated from whom Mary derived her descent. For we know that the fathers of women are the fathers likewise of those children whom their daughters bear. For Christ called one of his disciples previously known by the name Simon, Peter, since he recognized him to be Christ, the Son of God, by the revelation of his Father, and since we find it recorded in the memoirs of his apostles that he is the Son of God, and since we call him the Son, we have understood that he proceeded before all creatures from the Father by his power and will, for he is addressed in the writings of the prophets in one way or another as wisdom, and the day, and the east, and a sword, and a stone, and a rod, and Jacob, and Israel, and that he became man by a virgin, in order that the disobedience which proceeded from the serpent might receive its destruction in the same manner it derived its origin. For Eve, who was a virgin and undefiled, having conceived the word of the serpent, brought forth disobedience and death. But the Virgin Mary received faith and joy when the angel Gabriel announced the good tidings to her that the Spirit of the Lord would come upon her and the power of the Most High would overshadow her. Wherefore also the holy thing begotten of her is the Son of God. And she replied, Be it unto me according to your word. Luke chapter 1. And by her has he been born, to whom we have proved so many scriptures refer, and by whom God destroys both the serpent and those angels and men who are like him, but works deliverance from death to those who repent of their wickedness and believe upon him. And he goes on in this verse. You get the So Justin concludes with an idea he developed uh, in his apologies, which I'll discuss shortly, that anyone who acts with virtue, kindness, justice, and goodness has demonstrated an openness to God. This goes for, for the Jews like Abraham, Isaiah, Jeremiah, as well as for the Gentiles who followed God's will as spoken through his son, Jesus. Now, of course, Trifo at the end of all of this, did not stop being a Jew as a result of the dialogue. But it is historically important because Justin gave the first written, reasoned response to Judaism. 
that was free of polemics and accusations. If his example had been followed, the subsequent history between Christians and Jews would have been very different. In 138, two years after his dialogue with Trypho, Justin moved to Rome. He continued to support himself as a teacher. He joined a clandestine Christian group which met in the house of Martinus over the baths of Timotheus, a perfect location, as we've seen several others have chosen that, as Christians could easily blend into the steady traffic going into and out of the baths as well as the businesses which surrounded the baths. He moved to Rome in the first year of the reign of the emperor Antoninus Pius. Um, the uh, Antoninus, as we previously saw, was uh, you know, a fine example of, of a human being, uh, certainly among the, 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 the Roman emperors. And his quality led Justin to, to hope that this might be the emperor to finally legalize Christianity. The result of his attempt to accomplish that is known as Justin's first apology. And we talked about what an apology is. It does not mean I'm sorry. It's a reasoned defense of a particular position. Uh, Eusebius explains it as follows in his Ecclesiastical History, Book 4, Chapter 11, Section 11. Quote, But this same Justin contended most successfully against the Greeks, and addressed discourses containing an apology for our faith to the Emperor Antoninus, called Pius, and to the Roman Senate. That's the second, the second apologies to the Senate. For he lived at Rome, but who and whence he was, he shows in his apology in the following words. And then uh, Eusebius gives an excerpt from, but we, the, the apology has actually survived, so we're going to just uh, look at the text of the apology itself and give more uh, more substantial excerpts. So written around the year 155, uh, the first apology is consists of 68 chapters. Can't go through all of them, but uh, several excerpts. And we'll see it's used all over in the catechism. Chapter 1 is the address uh, to, to the emperor Titus, Elias, Adrianus, Antoninus, Pius, Augustus, Caesar, uh, and to his son, Verissimus, the philosopher, that, that's Marcus Aurelius. Uh, and he goes on, uh, I, Justin, the son of Priscus and grandson of Bacchaeus, natives of Flavia Neapolis in Palestine, present this address and petition on behalf of those of all nations who are unjustly hated and wantonly abused, myself being one of them. Chapter 2. Reason directs those who are truly pious and philosophical to honor and love only what is true. For we have come not to flatter you by this writing, nor please you by our address, but to beg that you pass judgment after an accurate and searching investigation, not flattered by prejudice or by a desire of pleasing superstitious men, nor induced by irrational impulse or evil rumors which have long been prevalent, to give a decision which will prove to be against yourselves. As for us, we reckon that no evil can be done us unless we be convicted as evil doers or proved to be wicked men. And he goes on like this in chapter 3, so picking up uh, chapter 4, an excerpt. Again, if any of the accused deny the name of Christian and say that he is not a Christian, you acquit him as having no evidence against him as a wrongdoer. But if anyone acknowledge that he is a Christian, you punish him on account of this acknowledgement. Justice requires you inquire into the life both of him who confesses and of him who denies, that by his deeds it may be apparent what kind of man each is. That those of the ancients whose opinions and teachings were quite diverse and yet all called by the one name of philosophers. And of these, some taught atheism. Epicurus was one. And the poets who have flourished among you raise a laugh out of the uncleanness of Jupiter with his own children. 
And those who now adopt such instruction are not restrained by you. But on the contrary, you bestow prizes and honors upon those who euphoniously insult your gods. Chapter 5. Why then should this be? In our case, who pledge ourselves to do no wickedness, nor to hold these atheistic opinions, you do not examine the charge made against us, but yielding to unreasoning passion and to the instigation of evil demons, you punish us without consideration, without judgment. For the truth shall be spoken. Since of old these evil demons, effecting apparitions of themselves, both defiled women and corrupted others, corrupted the innocent, and showed such fearful sights to men, that those who did not use their reason in judging of the actions that were done were struck with terror, and being carried away by fear, and not knowing that these were demons, called them gods, and gave to each the name which each of the demons chose for himself. And when Socrates endeavored by true reason and examination to bring these things to light and deliver men from the demons, then the demons themselves, by means of men who rejoiced in iniquity, compassed his death as an atheist, as a profane person, on the charge that he was introducing new divinities. And in our case, the demons display similar activity. All right, so remember that the fathers, they regarded paganism in different ways. Some just said, oh, it's, it's all just made up. It's just completely false religion. But others, and Justin is of the, this latter group, re regarded the pagan deities as existing, not, not, as, not as deities, but as demons, masquerading as deities. Okay, chapter 6. Hence, we are called atheists, and we confess that we are atheists, so far as gods of this sort are concerned but not with respect to the true God, the Father of righteousness and temperance, and the other virtues, who is free from all impurity. But both him and the Son, who came forth from him and taught us these things, and the host of the other good angels who follow and are made like to him, and the prophetic spirit we worship and adore, knowing them in reason and truth, and declaring without grudging to everyone who wishes to learn that we have been taught. All right, uh, chapter 7, I'll skip that. Uh, chapter 8 is, comes back to this that striking point that all Christians had to do is to save themselves is just deny it and sacrifice. An excerpt from chapter 8. And reckon that it is for your sakes we have been saying these things, for it is in our power when we are examined to, to deny that we're Christians. But we would not live by telling a lie. Chapter 9. And neither do we honor with many sacrifices and garlands of flowers such deities as men have formed and set in shrines and called gods, since we see that these are soulless and dead and have not the form of God. For we do not consider that God has such a form as some say that they imitate to his honor, but have the names and forms of the demons which have appeared. For why need we tell you who already know into what forms the craftsmen carving and cutting, casting and hammering, fashion the materials, and often out of vessels of dishonor, by merely shaping the form and making an image of the requisite shape, they make what you call a god, which we consider not only senseless, but to be even insulting to God who having ineffable glory and form, thus gets his name attached to things that are corruptible and require constant service. Uh, so skipping down, a brief excerpt from chapter 10. God accepts those only who imitate the excellence which resides in him, temperance and justice and philanthropy and many virtues as are peculiar to a God who is called by no proper name. Uh, skipping down, chapter 11. And when you hear that we look for a kingdom, you suppose, without making any inquiry, that we speak 
of a human kingdom, whereas we truly speak of that which is with God, as appears also from the confession of their faith made by those who were charged with being Christians. Though they know that death is their punishment, awarded to him who so confesses. For if we looked for a human kingdom, we should deny Christ, that we might not be slain, and we should strive to escape detection, that we might obtain what we expect. But since our thoughts are not fixed on the present, we are not concerned when men cut us off, since also death is a debt which must, at all events, be paid. By all. Uh, an excerpt from chapter 12. And more than all other men, are we, your helpers and allies, in promoting peace? Seeing that we hold this view, that it is alike impossible for the wicked, the covetous, the conspirator, and for the virtuous to escape the notice of God and that each man goes to everlasting punishment or everlasting salvation according to the value of his actions. Excerpt from chapter 13. What sober-minded man, then, will not acknowledge that we are not atheists, worshiping as we do the maker of this universe and declaring, as we have been taught, that he has no need of streams of blood and libations, whom we praise to the utmost of our power by the exercise of prayer and thanksgiving for all things wherewith we are supplied, as we have been taught that the only honor that is worthy of him is not to consume by fire what he has brought into being for our sustenance, but to use it for ourselves and those who need, and with gratitude to him, to offer thanks by invocations and hymns for our creation and for all the means of health and for the various qualities of the different kinds of things and for the changes of the seasons and to present before him petitions for our existing again in corruption in incorruption through faith in him. Our teacher in these things is Jesus Christ who also was born for this purpose and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the times of Tiberius Caesar, and that we reasonably worship him, having learned that he is the son of the true God himself, and holding him in the second place, and the prophetic spirit in the third, we will prove. For they proclaim our madness to consist in this, that we give to a crucified man a place second to the unchangeable and eternal God, the creator of all. For they do not discern the mystery that is herein, to which, as we make plain to you, we pray you to give heed. Excerpt from chapter 14. For we forewarn you to be on your guard, lest those demons whom we have been accusing should deceive you and divert you from reading and understanding what we say. For they strive to hold you their slaves, and sometimes by appearances and dreams and sometimes by magical impositions, they subdue all who make no strong opposition effort for their own salvation. And thus do we also, since our persuasion by the word, stand aloof from them, the demons, and follow the only begotten God through his Son. Okay, so... uh, Chapters 1 through 14, uh, it's obviously an appeal that Christians receive justice uh, because of the, the ridiculous circumstances that they have, uh, that, that which is you know inflicted on them. Uh, deals with the charge of atheism, so he pretty well explained that. I won't uh, you know, uh, belabor that. It's as obvious. Uh, He did. I skipped one of the chapters I skipped was he gave a lengthy catalog of uh, these demons masquerading as gods, uh, revealing, you know, their true nature, different things that Zeus did and others. I I won't I won't go through all that because some of it's pretty uh, depraved. Uh, Disloyalty. 
uh, another. Actually, I think I'm. I think I'm going to talk about that later. But if, if in case I forget, he does use that famous quote from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22, about render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And he did point out in one of the excerpts I read that Christian morality actually is it is advantageous to the state because we teach nonviolence, we teach obedience. Um. All right. All right. So we're going to uh, chapter 15, an excerpt concerning chastity. He uttered such sentiments as these, meaning Jesus. Whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart before God. And if your right eye offends you, cut it out, for it is better for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven with one eye than with two eyes be cast into everlasting fire. And whoever shall marry her that is divorced from another husband commits adultery. And I'm writing that, we've gone through the way these, these Romans handle their family life, so that <laughs> that's, that's obviously going to be one stumbling block to conversions. But, I mean, that's what Jesus said, so, you know, we we have to... Again, if, if we were just making up a religion, you know, we'd make one up that's easier. You know, that, that would appeal to more people. So we wouldn't come up with rules like that that are going to cause problems for us. So we only have those rules because that's what Jesus taught us. Uh, and our love. Uh... Uh, so, uh, yeah, skipping down, uh, the same uh, quote. And of our love, our love to all, Jesus has taught us, if you love them that love you, what new thing are you doing? For even fornicators do this. But I say unto you, pray for your enemies, and love them that hate you, and bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. It's a reference to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 and Luke chapter 6. And that we should communicate to the needy and do nothing for glory. He said, give to him who asks. And from him that would borrow, turn not away. For if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what good is there in that? Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust corrupt, where robbers break through. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts. But what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world but lose his soul? And he goes on like that, just making quotes from the Sermon on the Mount as a way, as a testament to Christian morality. What do we actually believe? Uh, and be kind and merciful as your father's kind and merciful. As it goes on like that. Okay, so uh, skipping down uh, uh Chapter 16, be patient of injuries, don't swear, always speak the truth, worship God alone. Oh, yeah, here's, uh, so chapter 17 is about the, you know, the dealing with the accusation that Christians cannot be good citizens because their loyalty is to some other kingdom. So it's chapter 17, quote, And everywhere we, more readily than all men, endeavor to pay tax to those appointed, both ordinary and extraordinary, as having been taught by Jesus. For at the time, some came to him and asked him, if one ought to pay tribute to Caesar, and he answered, tell me, whose image does the coin bear? They said, Caesar's. And he said, render, to, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but to God the things that are God's. Okay, let's skip that. Uh, chapter 18, uh, he, he, he goes through uh, different philosophers, uh, and we've got, I won't repeat all that. Uh, chapter 19, uh, chapter 20, 21, 22. All right, so uh, chapter 23, quote, And that this may now become evident to you, firstly, that whatever we assert in conformity with what has been taught us by Christ and by the prophets who preceded him are alone true and are older than all the writers who have existed that we claim to be acknowledged, not because we say the same things as these writers said, but because we say true things. And secondly, that Jesus Christ is the only proper Son 
who has been begotten by God, being his word, and first begotten, and power, and becoming man according to his will. He taught us these things for the conversion and restoration of the human race. And thirdly, that before he became a man among men, some, influenced by the demons before mentioned, through instruments of their poets, those circumstances as having really happened, which having fictitiously devised, they narrated, in the same manner as they have caused to be fabricated the scandalous reports against us of infamous and impious actions, of which there is neither witness nor proof, Chapter 24, and he goes on to the varieties of, of heathen worship. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, in the first place, uh, we furnish proof because those, uh, uh, we say things similar to what the Greeks say. We only are hated on account of the name of Christ. And those, uh, and though we do no wrong, are put to death as sinners. Other men in other places, worshiping trees and rivers, mice and cats and crocodiles, and many irrational animals. Nor are the same animals esteemed by all. But in one place one is worshipped, in another another, so that all are profane in the judgment of one another, on account of their not worshipping the same objects. And this is the sole accusation you bring against us, that we do not reverence the same gods as you do, nor offer to the dead libations and crowns for their statues. For you very well know that the same animals are with some esteemed gods, while to others they are wild beasts. Uh, chapter, uh, skip that, down to chapter 26, uh, he deals with what he calls magicians. So these are the Gnostics. Uh, he mentions Simon Magus, uh, Menander, Marcion. Uh, you know, he even mentions that there's a statue to Simon Magus that the Romans are worshiping him. That's in chapter 26. Uh, so I want, we, we've covered all that earlier, so I'm going to repeat all that. Chapter 27. Uh, but as for us, we have been taught that to expose newly born children is the part of wicked men. And this we have been taught, lest we should do anyone an injury, and lest we should sin against God. First, because we see that almost all so exposed, not only the girls, but also the boys, are brought up to slavery and prostitution. Uh, so we go on. I mean, that's, we talked about that earlier with the DDK, that, uh, you know, that, that, whole, that whole game that people played. All right, skip that. Um, chapter 31 uh, on the prophets. Uh, there were then among the Jews certain men who were prophets of God, through whom the prophetic spirit published beforehand things that were to come to pass before they ever happened. And their prophecies, as they were spoken, and when they were uttered, the kings who happened to be reigning among the Jews at the several times, carefully preserved in their possession when they had been arranged in books by the prophets themselves in their own Hebrew language. And when Ptolemy, king of Egypt, formed a library, this is in Alexandria, and endeavored to collect the writings of all men, he heard also of the prophets and sent to Herod, who was at that time king of the Jews, requesting that the books of the prophets be sent to him. And Herod the king did indeed send them, written as they were in the foresaid Hebrew language. And when their contents were found to be unintelligible to the Egyptians, he again sent and requested that men be commissioned to translate them into the Greek language. Seminarians, that's the Septuagint. That's the, that's the pre-Christian Greek translation of the Old Testament, used because you know the Hellenistic in the Hellenistic period when Greek was the, you know the the most widely spoken and understood language. Chapter 33 goes into Isaiah chapter 7 about the virgin shall conceive. I won't repeat that. Chapter 34, the prophecy from Micah that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, 
chapter, skipping down to chapter 46, uh, the, the Logos, the Word, you know, that, that existed. This is a, the Christians before Christ, that, this, this, this whole idea, or as the Catechism expressed at the preparation for the Gospel. Quote, uh, chapter 46, But lest some should, without reason, and for the perversion of what we teach, maintain that we say that Christ was born 150 years ago under Cyrenius, and subsequently in the time of Pontius Pilate taught what we say he taught, and should cry out against us as though all men who were born before him were irresponsible, let us anticipate and solve the difficulty. We have been taught that Christ is the firstborn of God, and we have declared above that he is the word of whom every race of men were partakers, and those who lived reasonably are Christians, even though they have been thought atheist, and among the Greeks, Socrates and Heraclitus and men like them, and among the barbarians, Abraham and Ananias and Azarias and Mishael and Elias and many others whose actions and names we now decline to recount, because we know it would be tedious, so that even they who lived before Christ and lived without reason were wicked and hostile to Christ and slew those who lived reasonably, but who, through the power of the Word, the Logos, according to the will of God the Father and Lord of all, he was born of a virgin as a man, It was named Jesus, and was crucified, and died, and rose again, and ascended into heaven. An intelligent man will be able to comprehend from what has already so largely said, and we, since the proof of this subject is less needful now, will pass for the present to the proof of those things which are urgent. So then it goes through some more prophecies that the destruction of Judea was foretold. Uh, uh, Chapter 56 reasserts that the pagan deities are actually demons. Uh, Chapter 58, he goes into Marcion again, how Marcion misrepresents Christianity. Chapter 59, he goes into, uh, makes an assertion that Plato uh, was actually familiar with Jewish teaching and that that, you know, the, that Jewish monotheism helped him to arrive at his insight about the prime mover. Um, so he makes that, a, Justin explains that in chapter 59, if you're interested, of the first apology. All right. All right, uh, skipping down to chapter 61. Uh, in the 60s, all the chapters in the 60s, this is the more uh, historically value. So what we covered previously was the theological and the apologetic value of his work. So in the 60s, we have the historical snapshot. There's theology in it too, but he's recording some very early in the in second century how the church lived as church, meaning the sacraments. So chapter 61 on baptism. Quote, I will also relate the manner in which we dedicated ourselves to God when we had been made new through Christ, lest, if we omit this, we seem to be unfair in the explanation we are making. As many as are persuaded and believe that what we teach and say is true, undertake to be able to live accordingly, are instructed to pray and to entreat God with fasting for the remission of their sins. Then they are brought by us where there is water and are regenerated in the same manner in which we were ourselves regenerated. For in the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washing with water. For Christ also said, Unless you be born again, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's John chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, Okay, so baptism. Uh, And for this rite, we have learned from the apostles this reason. Since at our birth, we were born without our own knowledge or choice by our parents coming together and were brought up in bad habits and wicked training in order that we may not remain the children of necessity and of ignorance, but may become the children of choice and knowledge and may obtain in the water the remission of sins formally committed. There is pronounced over him who chooses to be born again and has repented of his sins the name of God the Father and the Lord of the universe, 
he who leads the person that is to be washed, calling him by this name alone. All right, uh, skip down. Chapter 65. Uh, but we, after we have thus washed him, who has been convinced and has asserted, assented to our teachings, bring him to the place where those who are called brethren are assembled, in order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for the baptized person, and for all others in every place, that we may be counted worthy, now that we have learned the truth by our works also to be found good citizens and keepers of the commandments. Having ended the prayers, we salute one another with a kiss. There is then brought to the presider uh, of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with water, and he takes them, gives praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and offers thanks at considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things at his hands. And when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgivings, all the people present express their assent by saying, Amen. This word, Amen, answers in the Hebrew language as genoito, so be it. And when the presider has given thanks and all the people have expressed their assent, those who are called by us deacons give to each of those present to partake of the bread and the wine mixed with water, over which the thanksgiving was pronounced, and to those who are absent they carry away a portion meaning to the sick. Uh, chapter 66. And this food is called among us Eucharistia, the Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true and who has been washed with a washing that is for the remission of sins and unto regeneration and who is so living as Christ has enjoined. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our blood and flesh be trans by transmutation are nourished, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. For the apostles and the memoirs composed by them, which are called Gospels, have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them, that Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, said, Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. And that after the same manner, having taken the cup and giving thanks, he said, This is my blood, and gave it to them alone, which the wicked devils have imitated in the mysteries of Mithras, commanding the same thing be done. For that bread and a cup of water are placed with certain incantations in the mystic rites. So I think it goes on about how the pagans are, you know, mis yeah, well, you get them. Uh, chapter 67. And afterwards, continually, and we afterwards, continually remind each other of these things. And the wealthy among us help the needy. And we always keep together. For, uh, and for all things wherewith we are supplied, we bless the Maker of all through his Son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Spirit. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. As long as time permits, then, when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray. And as we before said, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought, and the priest in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability, and the people assent, saying, Amen. And there is a distribution of each, and a participation of that over which thanks have been given. And to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. Okay. Now, the Catechism uses all these last sections in the 60s. Uh, for obvious reasons, because it you know continues, uh, extends further the uh, uh, the continuity, the line of continuity. So the Catechism number twelve sixteen makes use of Justin's first apology, uh, chapter sixty one on baptism. Now we've already traced the continuity from the New Testament 
uh, Jesus accepted baptism. Then at the end of his ministry, Matthew 28, he instructed the apostles, go baptize all nations in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, we saw the DDK, chapter 7, uh, you know, verify that. And then here we see it again, that, you know, he, he refers the in the water and the Trinity. Justin referred to both. Uh, he mentions, he also mentions the preparatory fast, uh, the, the water and the use of the Trinitarian formula. And he, and he gives the reason, the scriptural foundation, as Jesus told us to, he said, unless you're born again of water and the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom. The catechism number 2174 makes use of Justin's apology, chapter 67 on Sunday as the Lord's day. So the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 8 through 10, as well as the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, record the commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day. And the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, says that the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So it doesn't abrogate the Sabbath, but it's, you know, Jesus is also Lord of that. So the Catechism reviews the third commandment. Actually, excuse me a minute, I don't want to, uh, we have confirmation tonight, so that's what all this is about. All right, uh, sorry about that. Um, Uh, so the Sabbath. So the, uh, the the Jewish Sabbath was celebrated on Saturday, which is the seventh day of the week. As the Old Testament records, that's the day on which God rested, the conclusion of the first creation. Uh, whereas the New Covenant is the is the uh, uh, the first uh, the physical creation of the universe ended on the seventh day, whereas the New Creation began with the resurrection on the first day. So that's why the Christians. Uh, you honor honor the Sabbath. So it's not we're not repudiating the Sabbath, but the spiritual truth of the Sabbath uh, is 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 you know is celebrated on on the Sunday. Okay, uh, the Catechism number thirteen forty five uh, uh, actually takes a very long a long quote from chapters sixty five through sixty seven about the Mass, how it was celebrated in the early second century, uh, and uh, which I just read. And we also see the continuities there uh, from the DDK chapters 9 uh, and, and 10, St. Clement of Rome's letter to the Corinthians chapter 40 and 44, St. Ignatius' letter to the Ephesians chapter 20, St. Ignatius' letter to Smyrna chapter 8. Uh, the Catechism number 1351 makes reference to Justin's first apology number 67, uh, making reference to a collection for charity. Uh, it's a notable continuity regarding charity in the form of a collection of taking, you know, passing the basket, essentially, uh, in Sunday Mass. And this is aligned with the Old Testament prophetic tradition of care for the poor, as well as the selection of the first deacons in Acts chapter 6. In historic terms, it is essential to understand that Justin was addressing this to a Roman audience for whom the proposition of giving charity to strangers was incomprehensible. Um, 
to the Roman mind, as we covered, uh, relationships were built on reciprocity. A Roman would help a family member with the expectation that, that he or she would receive help in future times. A patron would help a client in times of need because of the reciprocal obligations that we discussed earlier in the course. The wealthy provided, uh, who provided the muni and the government who provided the ludi did so in the expectation of support and votes in return. Whereas to the Roman mind of the first and second centuries, the destitute poor who had no family, no patrons, and lacked the voting rights of citizenship were, to the Roman mind, garbage, fit only to be thrown away. So from that point of view, one does not help garbage to become better garbage. One just throws the garbage away. The Christian demand to give to those who did not have the ability to return anything was repugnant to the pagan Roman mentality. And that represented a long-term obstacle to Christian evangelization. And frankly, even today, uh, you know, uh, that's still a problem. The Catechism number 1355 makes use of Justin's first apology, chapter 66, on the word Eucharist. Uh, defining the word. So the Greek word Eucharist is an elision of two, two Greek words. So the prefix EU, that's actually a word in Greek, EU, it just means well, uh, good or well. Uh, plus the suffix uh, karezithai means to show favor. Uh, so when elided together to make the new word eucharistia, it denotes that a favor has been well received. Hence, eucharistia describes the posture, words, and actions of thankfulness, of, of behaving well, of showing to, in order to show that a gift has been well received. In the context of the Mass, thanksgiving for the miracle by which the one perfect sacrifice of Christ is made present again, and we are allowed to receive the real presence of Christ. Okay. Also mentions the uh, the bread and wine that the wine was mixed with water. Uh, the word "Amen" uh, was used. And uh, okay, in the conclusion, chapter sixty-eight uh, makes reference to the letter that we quoted earlier from uh, his uh, predecessor, the Emperor Hadrian, which stipulated that Christians. Uh, repeated basically Trajan's, what Trajan had said, Christians were not to be actively hunted and no one was to be arrested on a, on an anonymous accusation that they were Christian. But if someone did put their name to the accusation and the person did confess the law, meaning capital punishment, was still to be carried out. Uh, let's see. All right, Eusebius recorded that the Emperor Antoninus did issue a letter on the subject of Christians, but it did no more than had the earlier letters of Trajan and Hadrian. Uh, So it's quoted in the Ecclesiastical History, Book 4, Chapter 13. Uh, Quote, the emperor, Caesar, Marcus, Aurelius, Antoninus, Augustus, Arminicus, Pontifex Maximus, for the 15th time tribune, for the third time consul, to the common assembly of Asia, hail. I know that the gods also take care that such persons do not escape detection, for they would much rather punish those who will not worship them than you would. But you throw them into confusion, and while you accuse them of atheism, You only confirm them in their opinion, which they hold. It would indeed be more desirable for them, when accused, to appear to die for their God than to live. Wherefore also they come off victorious when they give up their lives rather than yield obedience to your commands. So Antoninus is observing, well, you're making martyrs of them, you know, and literally... um, And in regard to the earthquakes which have been and are still taking place, 
It is not improper. Okay, so he's gonna. That was one of the reasons they were doing the roundup of Christians, just to um, you know, pacify people. Uh, so skipping down to uh, section six of that letter. But in regard to these persons, many of the governors of the provinces wrote also to our most divine father, not his actual father, means his adoptive father, the Emperor Hadrian, to whom he wrote in reply that they should not trouble these people unless it should appear that they were attempting something affecting the Roman government. And to me also, many have sent communications concerning these men, but I have replied to them in the same way that my father did. But if anyone persists, the person who is accused uh, you know, shall be punished. Okay, uh, the following year, 156, uh, Justin wrote a second apology, this one addressed to the Senate of Rome. Now, I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to stop because I got confirmation. That's what all this is going on. I got confirmation tonight. So, um, and if I stop this, I, I don't know how to restart where I left off. So I'm just going to have to finish that. I guess we'll have to do, it'll just be a, a, another, this will be a second file. This will be part B. And I'll look at what's left and either do a part C on Anicetus or just just move on to the next Pope Soter. Uh, it depends. So, uh, seminarians, I'm sorry about this, but, you know, you'll understand it. Sometimes it, <sighs> last two weeks, it's just it's one thing after another. All right, so uh, with all due apologies, thank you for your attention. Uh, this session is adjourned. <laughs>